Hi everyone, my name's Tom, this is my G6R1100 Turbo and in this video we're going to be doing a bit of a walk around but first I'd like to say a big thank you to Ram Mounts. Ram Mounts have supplied us with a mount for the GoPro and we're going to be using this in this video today but a little bit about the bike. The bike was initially built years and years ago by Egbert Van Popter which is a guy from Holland. He used to do wheelies on this at Elvington, something I inspired to do so I did that for years. Now I passed hands and I bought it off one of my friends. And ever since then, I wanted to sort of improve it because I found things that could be better. And also there was one big factor. I wanted to do faster wheelies than the previous owners. I knew that, I, well, I wouldn't say I knew, I believed that I could do it. So what I did is I adapted things on the bike. I got the fuel in better. I changed the handlebars, you know, small changes across the whole platform and then ended up beating their speeds and setting a higher record in the class, which I was super chuffed about because it achieved what I wanted to do, which was the wheelies within the 180 mile an hour mark. So what's the top speed of the bike? Well, to answer that question, the fastest it's ever been is actually on one wheel, which is 184.8 miles an hour. I've never ever actually pinned it wide open on with two wheels on the ground. Mm -hmm. What do you reckon it'd do? Um, well, there's a website, people may be aware of this website, called Gear Commander. Now, Gear Commander states, with the current gearing, with the power that it does have, I assume anywhere between probably 200 and 205 miles an hour, but without a fairing, that's quite a push. The bike itself is a 1991 GSX-R1100, and as you know, it is turbocharged. We've already uh, spoke about that down the bottom. The turbo itself is off a Volvo C70, I believe in 1996 to a 2000 car surprisingly. Um, on a few shots you may be able to still see the Volvo actually still on the casting mark for the turbo itself. Right, so on the engine this side, you know, you can see you've got the barrels and everything else, but the charge pipe that comes down from the turbo, this carries your boost into the, the plenum chamber, which basically re, what you would say would be your air box, but an air box is then removed off this because you need to hold pressure. Inside the plenum chamber, there's a couple of O-rings that actually seat onto the carburetors itself, and we hold it together with bits of rubber basically behind it. It's very primitive, but the system works, and it's a beautifully handcrafted piece of aluminium there, I think. The major thing really on this side, this difference is I've got billet aluminium engine casings. Um, the reason why I went with billet is these add a lot of rigidity to the engine. Some may think it's a myth and say that the casings are designed and they are strong enough. However, I personally believe that these casings will add that little bit more rigidity to the actual engine itself because this engine was designed for 120 to 130 horsepower and we're actually producing 280. spot some more additional engine casings one on the timing cover here and secondary on the clutch casing with an extension and this sort of somewhat shiny aluminium tank on the side now the re the sole purpose for this aluminium tank is purely to catch oil and drop it in the bottom end if we get any blow by on the piston rings you can sort a spot on this side you can see a little bit of the wastegate for the turbo manifold itself which but is the wastegate mate this is the wastegate on the turbo system here yeah. just for people that don't know uh, what the wastegate's sole purpose for is just basically regulating to stop it from over boosting mm -hmm. quite simple setup um, and you can spot as well or you might have to come a little bit further around there is a, a large fuel filter of what we use there just point to it just this large fuel filter that's underneath the plenum here mm -hmm. frame wise is an 1100 but the bike itself is a 750 rear end 750 tank with the bandit 1200 barrels and head with a bandit 1200 bottom end you might think well it's a g6r 1100 but it does have an 1100 crank and an 1100 cams the engine internals in this are out of a gen 1 hayabusa which is a very common modification on these bikes they use the gen 1 booster pistons gen 1 busser rods uh, and you do a slight overbore on the barrels, which then equates to the whole 1216, uh, 1216cc, I might add to that. So with the oil cooler as well, for the cooling effect, as we know, these are oil and air-cooled engines. Uh, I went with the Dash 6 or AN6, depending on what you want to measure them in. Uh, lines up to a Hell Performance 19-row 
330 cooler and this for me works absolutely perfect on the bike it keeps the oil temperatures down and we've never had a point where it's actually boiled over on the temperatures so I'm pleased with that it gets to around about 160 to 170 degrees on the dash and that's perfect enough for this bike so the exhaust system is a 316 exhaust system done by Dominic at K2 Design and Fab it comes straight out the system and it is a three inch all the way to a custom made silencer and this silencer was done by Jack Frost and this is the one that we use for noise regulations at Elvington when we are doing the racing itself. Isn't actually very quiet though is it? Not really, no. We put a 17 tooth front sprocket on and then we run a 42 or a 44 rear um, and that gearing is what gives us the torque that we need and also the extended amount to the gears because these are only a five speed gearbox. So what we change on the electrics as you can clearly see here there's some larger cables of what we've done for the battery positive and negative so the starting procedures and all the electrics that nestle usually next to the um, battery box here have actually been shoved right into the back end of the bike. And the purpose for that is, is to just keep everything away from the heat. Because there's a lot of heat that's generated in this area. We are planning on moving the battery, but for the time being, the starter solenoid, the fuse box, and the CDI is all right at the back near the backlight. Any of the uh, generation of people that recognize these sort of bikes might spot that this swinging arm is actually slightly shorter than a G6R 1100 swinging arm because it's actually a 750 arm. The 750 arms, are 60 millimeters shorter from the pivot bolt to the end here mm -hmm. and the reason why it's better for the wheelies is it's easier for it to overcome in fifth gear at high speed so you don't have to lift the bike further off the ground than what you need the axis completely changes and it's a much easier thing to wheelie what about spring rates mate and damping ah well the spring rate itself is, you have to slightly jack the bike up a little bit. Now Maxton in here is a quite a special Maxton shock that they built originally for the second owner of the bike. Now the spring rate on this is actually quite soft and the reason why you want it soft is not so it's bouncy but when you're doing the wheelie you need it to basically sink down and hold the boost but not try and rise back up otherwise it overcomes itself and brings the bike down. Now. It is quite odd when you're thinking about lifting it and then bringing it back down, but from experience, you want it where it's soft or you have it where it's almost locked out. On most sports bikes, rather than not boosted, you want it quite stiff, but on this, you want it soft. So, just as an aside, when you're doing a wheelie, you're doing the type of wheelie you're doing in competition is a power wheelie. Correct. It's not a, like a balance wheelie, is it? Not at this speed. So, the misconception with boost and natural aspirated is when you are doing a wheelie on a bike that is forced induction whether that's um, you know turbocharged and some supercharged bikes you're actually not on the balance point you are floating on boost because if you're on the balance point you're actually sat on the balance point you're not accelerating and you want to be accelerating so you have to balance it on boost whilst accelerating and doing a wheelie all at the same time So these brakes here, the reason why I went with the uh, billet calipers and the billet adapters is purely so I have a better choice in pads. As you can remember, the old Suzuki Tokikos, or if that's how it's pronounced, uh, you're very limited on the pads that you can actually buy for the bike. And also I just feel that, you know, 20, 30 year old technology is, it's, it's superseded now when you can buy calipers like this, where you can buy 10 different pads, all of different grades. People might recognize it. It's actually a Gen 1 K7 Hayabusa front end. The billet yokes were made by a friend of mine. Um, he made them on his CNC machine. And it actually uses the G6R 1100 steer stem in the center. And these, are, these, these forks have not actually been reworked. This is as Suzuki made them on the inside. Standard springs? Standard springs, Standard yeah. Damping. Works perfectly fine on this setup. The clip-ons themselves are actually Harris clip-ons here and there. 
Uh, they're a little bit period for the bike and they are a little bit uncomfortable but I wanted Harris clip-ons on this because I just think they suit the style and the era of the bike. So the steering stabiliser, steering damper, however you want to call these, this is absolutely critical when you have a bike with this level of power because as the bike squats on the back end it actually unsettles itself and as you land you can actually get what everybody knows as a tank slapper. So this can limit it, I wouldn't certainly say that it can stop it but this is something that's really important for doing the, this on the wheelies and using it for what it's for. Besides the uh, like literal sweep that it does that I absolutely love, every time you turn the bike on it gives you all that. The dash itself, we have oil temperature which is just upon the top of the engine there. You can see it's starting to climb now. We do have a clock, revs and then the speedometer. But other than that, it's really simple. We have an engine management light for the oil pressure and then the neutral switch. And the front wheel that's in the bike as you can imagine is actually a Hayabusa front wheel with a chopped mudguard and the rear wheel is actually out of a GSX-R SRAD 600. So the rear brake itself is off an MHP bracket which is an underslung with a 84mm billet caliper which we actually welded to the swinging arm using the brace under there. We use the standard Suzuki disc and then there's a few machined little parts on the inside of here to make it all fit but this actual adapter is for a GSX-R thou between a K1 and a K6. The Umbrella Corporation was from Resident Evil. Uh, people may remember it from the games, the series, you know, the, the actual films themselves. I grew up watching the films and fell in love and I always wanted a bike that looked like it was in Resident Evil. I know this doesn't, you know, there was no turbo bikes in Resident Evil, but I like the idea of what was in there. It was a bit ratty, a bit street bike-like, and I just like, I've always loved the brand and I just think it looks cool. Do you know what? This bike is fantastic to ride on the road. The reason being is, is as I said previously in the video, I spent a lot of time correcting things. And when I say correcting things, I worked on the carbs a lot to get the fueling right. Whilst the bike used to make 270 horsepower in boost constantly, it ran so poorly in the bottom end, it was horrible to ride. Since sorting all the problems out that it had, I actually can ride it on the road. It's got 150 horsepower before it even comes onto boost. So that basically means that it will ride anywhere on the roads with more than enough power and it just is beautiful to ride. Whilst it's a little bit uncomfortable, it handles well, it goes around corners, it stops, everything you want. Fuel economy and when does the boost come in? What revs? Oh well, fuel economy, if, you, if you're concerned about the environment, this isn't the bike for you. you. If you're on a good run, you'll get 75 to 80 miles per tank sort of sat coming into boost you know using it if you are actually going flat out at elvington i've seen this bike use between two and a half to three and a half liters per mile of fuel on full boost mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 